Good morning, friends. I want to say welcome to Vernonia Church and our online teaching time. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. My name is Sam. I'm the pastor here at Vernonia Church in Vernonia, Oregon. And it's my privilege to dive into this series where we're talking about Esther uh, living a life in exile. And today we're going to continue this series where we're going to talk about living for a higher mission. And it's going to be a great day. Before we do anything, want to encourage you, make sure you're liking, subscribing, make sure that you're sharing these messages with people uh, who you think will be blessed by them. Make sure if you're on YouTube, you're hitting sub notification bells, if you're on uh, the podcast and everything, that you're doing all the things that help us grow as we try to reach out into the world beyond the borders of our small little town as we try to reach out with the message of the gospel. Well, I want to say thanks for joining me, and I want to go to God in prayer together as we think about living for a higher mission, as we think about how God wants us to live for something bigger than ourselves. Well, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we just want to come before you right now and ask that you bless this time that we dive into the book of Esther. God, I pray that you will uh, draw our hearts towards you, that you will break our hearts with the things that break your heart, that God, you will help us come to a place where we are just seeking your will, even when we live in a world that's turning away from you in so many ways. God, I pray for your will to be done in our world. I pray for your will to be done in our lives. God, I pray that you'll help us to live for you every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. We well, want to begin this morning by uh, talking about a man named Sparky. Now, Sparky, uh, well, he was one of these guys, that, that was his uh, nickname. He was one of these guys who just always seemed to be good at finding a way to lose when victory was so close. The story's told that one day, as a kid, he went to the movies and the movie theater was giving out butterfingers candy bars to the first hundred people that showed up and he was in line he was going to get one of those candy bars well he ended up being number 101 oh, man. well that seemed to be sort of the story of his life one time he decided that he wanted to uh, he wanted to do one of those drawing correspondence courses and when i grew up we used to get these things in the mail with uh, they would they would have you draw something and send it in to find out if you could qualify for a correspondence course. It was before the internet or email or or any way, shape or form of, of sharing. It was all done by snail mail. Well, this fella got into that course and and they found that well he was he was okay at drawing, but man he was horrible. He sort of scored the lowest in trying to draw children, which is interesting because later he would uh, create a career rear drawing children. Oh, another time he was asked by a teacher to put drawings, uh, submit some drawings for the school yearbook, and, and he put all those drawings in for the school yearbook, and none of them got put into the yearbook, which I'm sure later on uh, a lot of the students and, uh, and, and even the school probably regretted that decision. Well, uh, he wanted to have a career in drawing. He loved to draw and doodle. And uh, so he took that correspondence course serious. He got into it. He thought maybe he was moving towards a career in drawing. Well, then World War II broke out, and he had to go to the battlefield and pick up a machine gun rather than a pencil. And so he went, uh, he went to war. And in war, he ended up kind of uh, climbing the 
the ranks of command. He ended up being a machine gunner. He ended up kind of commanding a group of machine gunners. And after the war was over, he went home, and now he decided he's going to get involved in drawing and uh, and artwork again. He got involved with that correspondence course, uh, and he he began teaching in it, and he he met this red-haired lady that he sort of fell he uh, head over heels for. Well, her mother said to her that this, this fella named Sparky will never amount to much, and so she convinced her to not marry him, but to marry someone else. <laughs> well, well it's, uh, later we would see that uh, in, in Sparky's artwork, there would always be this red-haired little gal uh, who would always be loved, but always always loving someone else said and so we could see where she comes from uh, from that part of the story well sparky he was kind of like, like i said used to having loss in in the midst or, or at the clutches of gain and uh, and and he would bring that into his artwork. He, he would bring it in as he would draw. He he wanted to start putting together a comic strip. He convinced a, 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 a press, a local press, to put his artwork in. Once a week they began, and he he began putting this comic strip out. He called it Lil Folks, L-I-L, uh, Folks. And uh, it was a story about kids, and and the main character in these stories was a character kind of like him. He would always have troubles and struggles, and come close to victory but experience defeat. And and really, there was a sense of suffering with this main character. Well, people related to it, and they liked it. And he tried to get this uh, group to uh, put his uh, put his comic strip every week seven days a week they refused to do it so he went on the search to find someone who would and then he found it and uh, the only stipulation was he had to change the name from lil folks to another name well that other name ended up sticking and staying with the comic strip he never liked it he always hated it well he decided that he was going to make these comic strips seven days a week and he was going to draw and man draw he did it's said that over the course of his career he made over 18,000 comic strips with these characters that over the course of his career uh, by the time he was done he had spent 50 years uh, making this comic strip that that over 355 million people had read his comics that 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 2,600 different newspapers put his comics into their newspapers. That all over the world, people were reading his newspapers uh, or his, his comics. They went to 75 different countries. Uh, it was put into 21 different languages. I mean, his comics spread because people could relate to the kids in his comics. They were different than other comics of his day. The characters, although they were children, uh, they would uh, they would deal with real emotions, real struggles, complicated issues, and smart conversations. And people really connected and identified with the characters in his stories. Well, Sparky put a lot of himself into the uh, the stories, especially that main character. Uh, he would he would he would find ways to make it just goofy. The way the main character would sort of come up short, like when his baseball team would uh, be in the first inning and it would be 63 to 0 or, or the games that he would never win and it would take over 40 years before Sparky would allow the, his base, this kid's baseball team to finally win a game. Uh, th that that he would make a Halloween costume with eye holes all over the Halloween costume of a ghost, and ex the eye holes were everywhere except in his eyes. And, and and then there was the catchphrases like "Good grief" or "rats," uh, or and then there was the little redheaded girl who would let him down, who would have eyes 
for another who would pull the ball out from under him every time he tried to kick it. And if you haven't guessed yet, you would know that Sparky was the nickname for Charles Schultz, the author of Peanuts, which if it wasn't for him being forced to change it, would probably still be called Lil Folks. Well, he put a lot of himself into his character, Charlie Brown. He made Charlie Brown relatable. One time he said this about Charlie Brown, that Charlie Brown must be the one who suffers because he's a caricature of the average person. Most of us are more acquainted with losing than we are with winning. And yet in the midst of struggle, uh, Charles Schultz would mildly weave into the fabric of, of who Charlie Brown was a bit of optimism, a bit of faith, and, and a bit of an idea that there's going to be a better future, like the way that Charlie Brown would always hope that eventually he would fly a kite that wouldn't be eaten by a tree. Or, or, or like the idea that Charlie Brown always held on to hope that Lucy, the little red-haired gal, was going to hold the ball football for him while he kicked it and that he was going to finally be able to kick that football. And more importantly, Charles Schultz would weave his faith in Jesus Christ into his comics. He, he would put his faith into it. He, he loved Jesus. He saw Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He was a Christian man, and uh, and so he would weave his faith and philosophy of faith into these comics that would go all over the world. Uh, he, he would weave it in in the way that Linus would tell the biblical story of the of the coming of the Christ, and he would recite scripture. He would weave it into the way that there were ideas of faith, hope, and love and charity for all woven into the comics, and there was definitely Definitely a sense of love your neighbor. Uh, even when it hurts, love Lucy. Well, it's almost as if God was using the struggles that Charles Schultz was having and the life that he was living to make him relatable so that one day he would be able to share a, a, a message with the world in a way that the world could relate to it. Well, Charlie Brown and Charles Schultz would struggle in life, have trials in life, just like we all do. And, and they would find a way to live for the purpose of God in it and through it. Well, that's what we're going to find today. As we come to the book of Esther, we're coming to this story about this woman who's living in a world that's rejecting God, who's living in a world filled with all kinds of hardship and trials. And she's living in this world, but she is going to grow. She's going to find a way to, well, to bring about the will of God in her world. And she's going to learn some important lessons as we come to chapter 4 four today in the book of Esther. Now, as we come to chapter four, there are four really important people to the story so far as we've been reading the book of Esther and learning about it. If you haven't gotten into or if you're just joining us this morning, you've missed the messages that we've covered previously. You're welcome to go back on our YouTube channel. You're welcome to go back, connect on our uh, to our YouTube channel through our website, www.vernonia.church. And you you can go there and you can catch up. But basically, if you were to read chapters 1 to 3, we would meet these four important people. The first person we meet is a man named Xerxes. Now, Xerxes, well, Xerxes is a rich, powerful, uh, he's a, a, a wealthy, powerful, extravagant, and self-worshipping pig. Uh, Xerxes is the king of Persia at the time. He wants to be worshipped like a god. He wants people to call him the king who is above all kings. Does that sound familiar? He wants people to think of him as, uh, as, as someone to be worshipped and adhered to and listened to like a god. Now he's not seeking the will of God. He's not seeking his creator god. He's not trying to love, uh, love god or humble himself before god. No, none of that at all. He's self-serving, self-worshipping, wants to be worshipped by 
others. He wants to use his power, wealth, and fame to get whatever he wants, whenever he wants it. I mean, he is an extremely selfish, self-indulgent person. As, as we look through the story of chapter 1 up to this point, we have seen that he is a man who will go to war to get what he wants. I mean, he, he's sort of, if we look at what's happening in the world today, look at Ukraine and look at Putin, you know, Xerxes and Putin, they kind of have the same mentality here. They're going to go to war to get whatever they want, kill who they need to kill in order to get what they want. Afterwards, he throws up party for six months 180 days and then he adds seven on it for six months he throws this party of extravagance so people could see his extravagant power and wealth and 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 they he has open bar the entire time so everybody's going to be drinking and getting drunk and and he throws this big party and he does it so that he could feel like he's being worshipped and and he'll even go so far as to take advantage of his power and position to claim uh, possibly hundreds of young girls all throughout the kingdom who will who will come to his bed to help him feel better about himself for a bad decision he made while drunk uh, if you remember the story he got drunk at this party he got uh, and he wanted his wife who is the queen to come and parade herself in front of his drunk friends she said no to him he went from lovey-dovey drunk to angry drunk in a moment and he banished her he, he divorced her he got rid of her and then he felt bad about it and he asked his friends for advice and they said why don't you just bring a whole bunch of virgins to your bed it'll make you feel better and he does just that this guy is gross his mission in life was to be his own god to be god himself and worshiped as a god and he didn't care who he had to use or abuse in order to feel good about what he's doing. That's one thing we'll notice is that the people of the world who live for the world, who live as their own gods, most of us are never going to be powerful and, and uh, have the authority or the money to do what Xerxes does. But in our own little way, some of us will live as if we think people should worship us and we will live as if we were our own gods and what you find is when people live that way they don't care who they have to use or abuse in order to feel good about what they're doing and that was Xerxes and then we met this guy named Haman and or Haman and if you don't remember his name you could always remember it because what do we say to people when we can't remember their name hey man you know so 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 we can remember this is Haman and Haman was sort of of like the well, he was the evil sidekick of the story. He's the he's the Xerxes wannabe and tag along. He sort of wants to be full of himself, just like Xerxes is full of himself. He loves power and, and glory and public recognition, and, and he has authority and power given to him by Xerxes, and, and he wants to feel good about his authority and power, so he gets Xerxes to agree that they're going to pass a law that whenever he walks into a room, or walks by that everybody ought to bow down to him. Now, can you imagine walking into a room where everyone bows down to you? Well, that's what he, he got. And Xerxes sent a message, a decree. And if you remember, whenever Xerxes said something, it was sent throughout all of Persia and became law. And it became received or accepted as if it was the word of a god. And so Xerxes said, everyone must bow down and worship. Well, uh, we see him as as he notices there's a guy who's not bowing down and he he gets furious about this guy who just refuses to bow down and, and he sort of puts himself into situations where he forces the issue. I'm going to walk by him again and make him see if he bows down again and, and uh, you know I'm going to I'm going to make sure that uh, he he's he's going to eventually bow. Well he works at it and and this fella named Mordecai, who we're going to talk about in a minute, just will not bow down to him. He finds out the reason that he won't bow down to him is because he's a Hebrew. He's a Jew who worships God and who will not bow down to and worship of anyone else. Well, he gets furious. You know, I don't care what the reason is. He should be bowing down to me. And he decides he's not only going to kill Mordecai, but he's going to kill 
every Jew, every Hebrew in all of Persia. He comes up with this grand scheme, this grand plan that involves a lot of money, that involves bribes, that involves uh, a, a scheduled date and time where all of the Jews in the kingdom are going to be killed. He brings it before Xerxes, gets Xerxes to actually issue a decree to put in as a law of the land, as the word of the God. God of Persia, uh, Xerxes himself, and he sends out the decree that says this is what's going to happen. People all over are upset. They don't know what to do about it. They're in mourning. They're scared. They're confused. But the but but Haman puts this action into order, and and he's sort of the he's sort of the the enemy, the the really bad guy in the story of Esther. Well, we see him, and he's doing kind of like Xerxes did. He's, he's a guy who wants to be worshipped, who wants to worship himself, who wants to be his own god. And again, he's going to do whatever he can do to, to get it. He's going to use people, abuse people, take advantage of people and situations in order to get what he wants. One thing we've noticed is that when we live for a mission— That's our own. When we live for ourselves, when we live for self-worship, often that's what we find. We're willing to hurt people, use people, walk over people, uh, tread on people in order to get what we think we deserve. Well, then we have Mordecai. We we met him too. Mordecai is uh, the older cousin of this young gal that he raised as his own. Uh, Mordecai will be a man who has this struggle. He's living in Persia as a Hebrew, as a Jewish man who wants to worship God, uh, even though he possibly had the chance to return to Jerusalem with those who did return already. He stayed in Persia for whatever reason, but in Persia, he felt like he he needed to keep his faith and his his service to God on the down low. He told uh, Esther, who we're going to meet in a minute, not to tell anyone about her faith and who she was. And, and he tried to keep his own faith and his own heritage quiet and on the down low too. But he will eventually be forced to reveal his faith and his belief. And, and in being forced, we're going to see him grow. We're going to see him grow in boldness and in strength. And we're going to see him grow in faith and faithfulness to God. Uh, But we will see this Mordecai and he will say, I will not bow down no matter what it costs me, no matter what happens here. I'm not going to bow down. And, And because he wouldn't bow to Haman, it creates this situation where out of Haman's hate, he makes the decree that all the Hebrews of the land ought to be killed. Well, we also met Esther and Esther was was the young cousin of Mordecai who had this series of unfortunate events like like Charles Schultz like like Charlie Brown she sort of comes up at the end of uh, of the stick every time i mean her family was was taken out of babylon her 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 family story her family history was they were taken out of out of Jerusalem and they were they were exiled all throughout babylon and uh, and so her family was was exiled in Babylon and then the Persians invaded and all of a sudden she went from being a, a, a Hebrew in Jerusalem or her family did a Hebrew in Jerusalem to uh, to to Babylonian living in exile to now they're Persians because the Persian king has taken over. And so she's growing up in Persia as a Hebrew, as a Jew who loves God and worships God. Uh, she's in this in this world that doesn't want anything to do with God, that has forgotten God, that is that that worships the king as if he's a god. And 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 so she she's in this circumstance like this. And then her parents die. And and because her parents die, her older cousin Mordecai raises her and she she ends up growing up there. And then the the day comes where the well, the government shows up. I mean, the 
those who work for King Xerxes show up and they say, hey, you're a pretty little young virgin. Uh, we're going to, we're going to uh, take you to the palace and prepare you to spend one night with the king. Oh man, I, I can't imagine how Mordecai felt about that. As a dad of daughters, I would have uh, had a real struggle with this part of the story. And I still struggle, even now, uh, just thinking about the idea. But but she gets the short end of the stick in that way. She's taken, uh, probably not uh, on her own free will. She's taken to the palace. She's given a year's worth of of different beauty treatments. Uh, we read about that, that they would put these girls through these beauty treatments, also that they could spend one night with the king. Most likely, all of the girls, probably hundreds of them, were brought to the king, and he never remembered their names after that night that he spent with them. Because it says that when they, uh, when they spent that night with them, if he didn't remember their names, they just went back to live in the harem, never to be called on again. It, it could there was potential here, and, and there was a reality here for many young girls that were just forgotten and left in the harem. Well, uh, she would end up going, and, and here sort of things will change a little bit. I, I don't know whether if I was Mordecai, I don't know if I would feel good about it or bad about it, but, uh, but, but the King Xerxes ends up liking her so much that he makes her queen, and I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's cool. I'm one side that she's queen, but I don't know if I want her to be queen to this guy. This guy's out of control. This guy's a loose cannon. This guy's gross, and he's a pig, and he's a self-worshipping dude. I, I mean, I wouldn't want my daughter being married to someone like Xerxes. Well, that's what happens, and, and we meet her here, and, and in this moment, and what we see is that Mordecai and Esther, they will both grow in their faith, and and we will notice something different about them. Throughout this story, Xerxes and Haman will worship themselves and use people and abuse people and do whatever they can at the cost of others to get what they want. But we will see that Mordecai and Esther they will want to see the will of God come about in the world. They will worship God. And because they worship God, they're willing to serve people. They're willing to sacrifice themselves to bless people as servants of God. There's a big difference when you live for a higher mission. And we'll see. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't think Mordecai and Esther were perfect. I, I don't think we read their story, especially at the beginning. I mean, both of them are struggling with this. Do we tell about our faith? Don't we tell about our faith? Do we tell about who we are? Don't we tell who we are? Well, they will go from a place of, of, of being scared to admit it to a place to where they are boldly proclaiming it and standing up for it. And, and we will see them grow, and there will be a process of growth as, as we go through their story. And, and I want to sort of leave that idea with you as we go through what we're going to go through today as uh, this teaching unfolds. I want you to think of the idea that sometimes God might be putting us in a place not to make the big, the grand, the, the exciting decision or move that's going to define our whole life. But maybe God's putting us in a place where we make small decisions and small steps that will eventually lead to that moment. Sometimes we think, oh, I will live for God, I will stand for God, and we think of maybe what, where's the big moment going to be, but maybe the big moment is going to be the accumulation of of little moments where we say, I'm going to grow. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to make some progress in my faith. I I'm going to make a choice that's going to help me grow just a little bit. And I'm going to just keep doing uh, the right thing, living for God's will. I'm going to look at my circumstance, where I'm at, look at my family, look at the town and the community, look at the church I'm in. And I'm just going to say, you know what? I'm going to serve God here uh, and, and I'm going to see God's will come about here and I'm going to grow. And maybe eventually in that growth, we will find where that big moment is as we make those little choices. Well, we're going to see that sort of happen in Esther's story here. And we're going to open up. 
finally get to the scriptures. If you open up your Bibles to Esther chapter 4, I'm going to read chapter 4, verses 1 to 17. And it says this, When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, talking about the edict that Haman put out there, the edict that Xerxes agreed to, in order, that said, let's kill all of the Jews uh, in Persia, which, by the way, amounted to millions of people. Well, when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap and ashes, he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. He he went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces. Uh, provinces. There was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, they wept, they wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. Well, when Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. When Esther sent, or then Esther sent Hathach, uh, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to her attendant, she ordered him to go and find Mordecai and find out what, find out what was troubling him and uh, and why he was mourning. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave uh, Hathach a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all the Jews. He, he asked Hathach to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. And so he also asked Hathach to direct her to go to the king and beg for mercy and plead for the people. So Hathach returned to Esther and, 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 and with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hathach to go back to and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court will, without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And then the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. Well, so Hathach gave Esther the message, uh, or gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther: "Don't think for a moment that because you're in the place or you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will rise up for some uh, from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made." made queen for just such a time as this. Well, then Esther replied to Mordecai, Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My, my maids and I will do the same. And, and then, uh, though it's against the law, I will go to see the king. If I must die, I must die. And so Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Well, here basically we have Mordecai saying he's, he's mourning and he's getting Esther's attention and he's saying to her, we need to do something about this. We need to grow in our faith. We need to live for a higher mission. And the time is now. We need to admit who we are. We need to fast and we need to pray. And we need to go to the king. But she says, it's illegal. Uh, if I do, I'll die. And he says, you're going to probably die anyways. Uh, because you're not going to escape this. You're going to be found out to be a Hebrew and a Jew. And, and you're going to be killed too. Don't think for a minute that just because you're the queen and you live in the palace that you're going to be able to avoid the law of King Xerxes. I mean, his last queen didn't. And uh, what makes her think she will? And so she says, all right, I'll do it. Well, there's a little bit more to that story as we read, but uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that we see here in this story where we see them living for a higher 
purpose. We see them living for a higher mission than the mission that most of the world is living for. Well, one of the things that sort we see at the, at the beginning of it is we see this idea of mourning. We see Mordecai, and he's mourning. He puts on sackcloth. He he puts ash on his forehead. It, it, it's a it, this is a picture of a spiritual practice of mourning. Now I want to say this: mourning is a spiritual thing. I think God gave us this th- th- this emotional response to brokenness and pain and sorrow uh, that call that we call mourning. And sometimes we ought to we ought to allow mourning to happen in our hearts and in our minds. We, we ought to allow ourselves to realize that that mourning over loss is a is a spiritual form of healing, that that mourning over sin, mourning over brokenness, mourning over a war, mourning over hurt and loss, and, and mourning over a lost world and a broken world, uh, that it's a spiritual thing. It, we live in a culture where mourning is sort of seen as a as a weakness. It's not strength; it's weakness. That that mourning, well, you know, you're bringing me down. Don't don't be so so realistic. Don't be so harsh or hard or or sad. And Mordecai, he looks at what's going on around him and he begins to mourn. He begins to mourn before the Lord and, and cry out to the Lord. Now we aren't told expe- explicitly who he's crying out too is an interesting thing that happens in the book of Esther uh, in the book of Esther it never mentions God's name. We're never told that he's crying out to God. We're never told they're praying to God. We're never told that they're seeing the hand of God. Uh, but we know who it is. We, we know who he's crying out to. We know who this Jewish man, this Hebrew man, who won't bow down to any other God or man or anyone other than to God. Uh, we know who he's crying out to, and he's crying out to God. Now, in our culture, even even though mourning is a sign of weakness, and I don't, I'm not necessarily sure why, we ought to realize that it is a biblical response to the world and, and the brokenness of the world. That, that we ought to allow ourselves a place of, of mourning over brokenness. God himself will have uh, m- have a heart that mourns, that breaks, that uh, th- that breaks and mourns over sin and death and loss and hurts uh, and all the things that are broken about this world and mankind. We're told in scripture that God mourns over it. Uh, and we even saw in the life of Jesus that Jesus himself wept uh, as he prayed for Jerusalem and and Jesus showed up at at the at the gravesite of his friend Lazarus and he wept over the death of his good friend and we're told that the the disciples they mourned and wept over the death of Christ and Mary and Martha and the ladies that were friends of Jesus they went to his tomb and they were mourning and they were weeping and they were emotionally responding and crying out and, and we even see that the apostle Paul will describe his own sense of mourning and weeping and and he will talk about the sorrow and the mourning that came to him in ministry those of you who are, are serving in a ministry, those of you who've been elders or teachers or leaders in a church, those of you who are pastors, who are my friends that are here, you're joining us online, maybe you can relate to the way that the Apostle Paul said that in ministry, I was mourning so much over the struggles and the perplexing things people were doing and the crushing things people did or said and, and the time where I was struck down and my ideas were struck down and my leadership was questioned and struck down. He said, it's like I carry death in my body. That's what ministry is like. I I carry death in my body so that the people I'm serving can have life. You kind of see Esther say something like that here. But Paul will describe it uh, that way in 2 Corinthians. He would say that I've been crushed in ministry, perplexed in ministry, struck down in ministry, and I carry death in my body so that Jesus' life may be known to you. And he even told them that sometimes he was under such pressure in ministry that, that he despaired of life itself. 
Wow. I mean, that's the Apostle Paul. I mean, the Apostle Paul was a tough dude. And sometimes we think, oh, men, you know, men shouldn't mourn, especially, right? We need to be strong for those around us. Well, well you don't find any manlier man than Jesus was, a, a carpenter who was willing to be nailed to a cross to give you hope. You know, uh, 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 one of the most torturous deaths to die, he went ahead and went through with it, even when he probably could have avoided it. That's a tough guy. And then you're talking about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul would be shipwrecked. He would be beaten to the point of death. He would be stoned where they threw stones at his face. I mean, this guy said that I bear the marks of Christ on my body. And what he meant was he had scars all over his face, probably from having stones hit him or from being beaten to death. And this guy would crawl up from a bloody pool, walk over to town, and keep preaching Jesus to the same people. People who did who put him there in the first place that's a tough guy and he said sometimes ministry just made me feel like I wanted to die there was a sense of mourning that he would feel in ministry he would carry it and and it's a sense of mourning and I just want to say to you especially you who are joining us today who are in ministry that you're not alone I know that your ministry is something where you carry the burdens of your people and you're perplexed and you're frustrated and you're hurt and you carry the weight sometimes just like the Apostle Paul did and you're in mourning and just remember the whole point is we carry death on ourselves so that we can give life to others. That's the ministry that God has put us here for whatever church you're working at. That's why God has you at that church so that you can bring the life of Jesus to the people you're working with. Well, I feel like today people, I feel like today people in our culture, in our society, we would criticize that idea of mourning and, and throwing on sackcloth and ashes and, and crying out to God. I mean, well, we would say things like, well, you know, don't mourn. Uh, we would say, you know, buck up. Jesus, don't cry so much. I mean, you're being a little bit dramatic here. The city of Jerusalem, well, it kind of brought it on itself. It has it coming, doesn't it? And, uh, and buck up, Jesus. Don't be so negative. Be strong for the rest of us. Your friend Lazarus died, but remember, he's in a better place. And, and I just want to puke every time I, I hear that at a, at a funeral. It's as if we're telling people, don't mourn. No, Scripture actually says about Christians that we mourn, but not as people who have no hope. We still mourn. We still let this death and this loss break our hearts. We still weep and cry and, and we mourn. But we mourn as people who have hope. Yes, they're in a better place. Yes, we have hope they're in a better place. But we're not telling you or asking you to stop crying or, or mourning. We want to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. And by the way, Scripture does even tell us that there is a time to mourn. It's a spiritual thing. And I feel like people today would, well, they, they would tell, they would tell the Apostle Paul, come on, pastor, buck up, be positive, ha have a more positive message, you know. Uh, come on, pastor, you care too much, you care, give those burdens to Jesus. Well, you think the Apostle Paul didn't give those burdens to Jesus? He still felt the mourning because he could see the things that broke God's heart, and it was breaking his heart. He, he could see the church doing things, bringing about a spiritual consequence, and even though we give it to Jesus, we let him carry the burden. 
burden, we also see the burden and there's a sense of mourning and sorrow that come with it. And we'd say, come on, pastor, be more positive. Give us some more of that feel good stuff. Give us more of that self-help. Give us more of that care bears and, and puffy clouds and, and give us more of that we're all good people and give us a pat on the back. Don't talk about judgy stuff. Talk about stuff that makes us feel good. Jesus would describe it as a world that, well, we want our preachers and pastors to give us messages that, that tickle our ears with things we want to hear. Don't get me wrong. There's a time for joy. Sometimes ministry and sometimes living for God and his will can be filled with joy and happiness and celebration. There's even an underlying joy that sort of stays with the sorrow as we live the Christian life. A joy that makes no sense, a joy that, that even in the midst of suffering and sorrow and mourning will be there. But so often I think we live in a world that medicates itself as much as it can out of mourning. We distract ourselves with busyness and hobbies and, and parties. We, we do like Xerxes. You know, we want to throw a party. We want to drink a drink. We want to celebrate our accomplishments or, or, or look at the things we have and, and worship ourselves. And we want to do everything we can to avoid Morning. And you do notice that, don't you? That Mordecai, he walked up and there was only a certain point to where he could get close to the palace. He couldn't pass a certain point because King Xerxes didn't want anyone who was mourning to come near him or close to him. Did you notice that? He doesn't want any mourning to come his way. Some people are like that. Don't tell me the hard truth. Don't make me sad. Don't, don't give me bad news. Don't be mourning around me. Uh, some people, they, they don't want that. They don't want to hear reality. Uh, someone starts talking about something that makes them sad or something that's real or something that's hard and, and it's it's almost like, well, let's change the subject, and uh, and you're bringing me down, man. Let's keep the wine flowing and the party going. Let's keep and watch. I, I know. Let's watch a comedy or or someone tell a joke, and or or you know what? Let's go visit the palace harem. <laughs> That's sort of what Xerxes' game was. He, he doesn't want to bask in in sorrow and mourning. He doesn't even want to face any of that. Instead, he just wants to think about all the goodness and wealth and power and authority that life can have. And, and he wants to think about all the good things in life. Don't bring me down. Don't make me sad. Don't bring me bad news. Don't bring me mourning Jews. Well, what I think we need to do here is sometimes we need to realize that mourning is actually part of the way that we realize we need to live for a higher purpose. I think of some things that we ought to be allowing ourselves to mourn about. We ought to be allowing ourselves to mourn about a broken world, a world where, where brokenness happens, where sickness happens, where death happens. And and we ought to be mourning those things. Some of you need to allow yourself to mourn. You need to allow yourself to mourn the loss that you've had. Instead of trying to be strong for everyone around you, mourn. Weep. There's a time to mourn, Scripture says, and a time to laugh. And, and maybe for you, you need to just allow yourself time to mourn. So you've heard it from your pastor. You know, go ahead. Let it out. Cry out to God and mourn. But I think there are a couple other things that we need to mourn. And sometimes uh, they would be things that people would say, oh, you're getting me down, man. Uh, but, but these are things that we ought to allow to break our heart. They're things that break God's heart, and they ought to be things that break our heart. Things like, well, we live in a world that's lost. We live in a world uh, that, that, that's, that's not going to heaven, but is doomed. Many of the people in our world are, are doomed to an eternal hell. And we live in a world that desperately needs Jesus. And, and there ought to be a time and a place where we allow our hearts to be softened to that truth. And where we allow our hearts to, to break for that truth. 
If you've never had a moment where you just broke over the brokenness of the world, over the lost of the world, maybe there ought to be a time where you allow God to break your heart over it, to moan over sin and brokenness and hurts that come in the world. There's a time to let the things that break God's heart break ours. It should make us mourn that we have family, that we have friends who don't know Jesus, who don't go to church, they're unchurched, who who don't have a relationship with God, who are not going to heaven that ought to break our hearts that ought to make us mourn that ought to get us to a place to where we want to cry out to God it should break our hearts and burden us that there are lost people and if you've never allowed God to break your heart to that point I would encourage you practice the spiritual practice of mourning there's also a time where we ought to mourn for our own sin and our own brokenness. We need to dig through the calloused hearts we have and the the stiff necks that we have and, and let our hearts break over our own sin. Instead of going out and celebrating yourself like Xerxes does, instead of avoiding your own problems or your own sin, or instead of distracting yourself from the reality of your brokenness with anything you can, sometimes we need to face ourselves in our own sin. Confess to God. Get broken before God. Be like the guy who kneeled before God, beating his chest and crying out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There comes a point to where we need to mourn and be broken over our sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul is going to talk to the church in Corinth, and he's going to tell them that, that he was glad he confronted them. There was a time where he really confronted this church that, that was full of people who were making him feel complex and 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 hard pressed and 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 discouraged and even <laughs> be feeling like he wanted to die as he's trying to lead this church that just it's like leading cats that just don't seem like they're going to walk and live for God's will even though they'd said they would they weren't and so he sends them this scathing letter and he wasn't sure how they were going to receive it but later he writes to them in second corinthians and he says this he says that 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 letter produced in you a godly sorrow. Did you know that there was such a thing as a godly sorrow? There's a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow. And and a worldly sorrow, it leads to death. It leads to doing things, uh, to to woe is me, being an Eeyore. It leads to to, uh, deep depression and suicide. And it leads in an ungodly way to an ungodly place. But but godly sorrow produces something different in us. And he says this. He, He says, the kind of sorrow, in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11, the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and it results in salvation. There's no regret with that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow which lacks repentance results in spiritual death. Did you see the difference? Worldly sorrow lacks repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. And here's why. He says, just see what this godly sorrow has produced produced in you such earnestness such concern to clear yourselves such indignation such alarm such longing to see me such zeal and such a readiness to punish wrong you showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right did you notice what he said godly sorrow does It leads to concern and indignation about who I was and what I've been doing. It leads to alarm about where I was going and where that road that I was on led to. It puts into me a longing to do the right thing, a zeal to live for God. It puts into me a readiness to do the right thing. And it leads me to do everything I can to make a turnaround in my life. And sometimes we need to... To allow ourselves to mourn, to break, to go into a godly sorrow about who we are and what we've been doing. 
Sometimes that's the best thing that can happen, the most worshipful thing that can happen in my life. We like to think of the idea as worship being, you know, an exciting singing service. But here what we're seeing is that sometimes worship can be my heart is breaking and mourning over my sin. And I say, God, I am so sick of what I've been doing and who I've been. I'm going to change. And that change begins by making choices, by, 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 by changing what I'm doing. And that, that becomes worshipful. Well, this, this sorrow that Mordecai is having is a sorrow over what's happening in the world around them. And it's a sorrow over the coming, the, the coming doom. The reality of the circumstance is, is that a day and a time has been set for millions of Jews to be killed all throughout the land of Persia. And so he goes to Esther and he begins, it says, fasting. Now, in the Old Testament and in the scriptures, fasting is a sort of prayer. It's a, it's a way that we pray. Fasting and prayer go hand in hand. And when I pray and fast, what I'm doing is, is fasting is where I say I'm going to not eat or I'm going to restrict myself from something. And when I miss that thing, it's going to remind me to pray some more. So I'm going to pray about this and then I'm going to fast. And then when I feel that hunger pain. I'm going to pray some more and I'm going to pray some more. On one side, I'm showing God how serious I am about this prayer. And on the other side, I'm showing myself how serious I am about this prayer. Now we're in a season where we as a church are going to be well, we are uh, fasting right now and praying as we get closer and closer to Easter. We as a church have said we want to practice fasting and praying too. And, and we're looking at the world around us. We're looking at our friends and our family. We're letting God break our hearts and bring us to a place of spiritual mourning where we realize these people in our life who we love, they need Jesus. And so what we're doing is we're fasting from something. Uh, you're welcome to join us, by the way. It's not too late. We're going to fast for 40 days. We call it our 40-day our Easter fast. And it, it, it already began uh, on March 2nd, and it will end on April 14th. We're going to stop doing it, but we're going to be fasting and praying as we as a church think about our friends who we want to be praying for, as we think about the people that need Jesus in our world. And we're going to uh, fast from something. Now, you might choose chocolate chocolate or coffee. You might choose TV. You might choose whatever it is that you choose that will be something you miss that reminds you to pray. It's a way for you to say, God, uh, I'm serious about this prayer. And it's a way for you to say to yourself, I'm serious about this prayer. And you're going to be praying not only for the, the people in your life that you love, who are who are lost, who need Jesus, but you're also going to be praying for an opportunity to invite them to Easter worship service at Vernonia Church. And, and you're going to be praying that they will say yes. And, and you're going to be praying for for our Easter services that we're going to be able to share Christ with many people who need to hear about Christ, that they're going to make a response to the message or that we'll plant seeds that will lead to a response that will lead to change, that will lead to us seeing God's will at work in our world. Another thing that we're going to do as a church, and I'd encourage you who are uh, where you're at, uh, whether you're here in town in Vernonia or wherever you are, is we're going to actually choose five names each. And we're going to begin praying for those people. We're going to pray that uh, they will come to know Christ. We will, we're going to pray that they'll have an opportunity to hear the message of Christ. We're, we're going to pray because they're lost and, and it breaks our heart that they're lost. And they might be five people. Maybe some of them are in your family. They're an aunt, an uncle, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, whatever they are. You're going uh, you're gonna to write their name down. And you're going to pray for them whenever you see, you know, you're going to put it somewhere you'll see it, uh, maybe on your refrigerator, maybe in your wallet, um, and, and you're just going to pray for them. You're going to pray that God will 
uh, open the door for an opportunity to share Christ with them. You're going to let it break your heart that they need Christ, but you're also going to pray for them. And you can do this while you're doing your fasting and you're praying. Bring them both together. Well, that's what Mordecai does. He's fasting and he's praying and, and he tells he tells uh, he tells Esther, uh, hey, we're, we're fasting and we're praying because the king has issued a decree to kill all of us. And and Esther says, well, what do you want me to do about it? And he says, what I want you to do about it is I want you to go and and, and tell King Xerxes, beg him, for, beg him for mercy on our behalf. I want you to go to him. Well, she says, well, my old hubby hasn't called me for 30 days. And the rule in the land is you don't come unannounced or you get killed. And the only way you don't get killed is if you become one of the lucky ones. When you're approaching, he lifts his scepter, says it's okay for you to approach. Which didn't happen very often, apparently, because she was so afraid and terrified of it. And I love what he says to her. He says to her, uh, interestingly, again, this is a book that, well, it, it doesn't mention the name of God. But we're going to see them praying and crying out to God. And we're going to see Mordecai right here make a statement about the providence of God in a powerful way. And he will say to her, who knows, perhaps you have been made queen for just such a time as this. Wow. Now he's not, I, I, don't, I don't think what he's doing is saying, who knows? Well, we know who knows. God knows. And he's not saying perhaps or maybe uh, such a, in such a way to say, well, I'm not sure, but it's possible. Uh, no, uh, he knows that God's put her in a position where she can do something about it. He knows that. And so, uh, and he's not saying, well, maybe fate brought this all together. He's not saying maybe uh, chance, happenstance, or circumstance brought this all together. He's not saying maybe karma brought this about. He's not saying that maybe the stars aligned and everything just fell into place. And, oh, it's your horoscope that brought it all together. No, because he knows that all those things are ungodly. And they're, not, they're a part of the Persian culture, not his. Uh, but he says, no. Who knows, maybe God is putting you here and where you are just so that you can serve him. Now, we have to be careful here because we don't want to overstate what I think he's saying. Uh, a person could ask, well, is what he's saying then that God gave this young woman over to this pig of a of a um, of a king to take advantage of her along with the hundreds of other girls that he brought into his bedchamber that 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 God put this young woman into a place to be taken without her um, with against her will that God you know no we're not saying that uh, you know, God has given people the power to make a choice. That's one of the things that makes us different from all the other things that he created. He gave us the power and the ability to choose. And and people have chosen sin, which has brought brokenness into the world. So often people will say, if there's a God, why is there suffering in the world? Well, there's suffering in the world because we brought it. God gave us the power to choose and, and we chose a lower mission. And that lower mission brings suffering and pain and brokenness and death and sin into the world and sin will beget more sin which has beget more sin which creates a world filled and so we're not necessarily saying that the life that you lived and the suffering that you lived and the hardships that you experienced it wasn't that God created them and made them no Xerxes is responsible for the sin that he brought into the story and and the world World and the brokenness of the world and the people of the world are responsible for the brokenness of this world. You know, it, we can't blame God that you were abused or grew up in an abusive family. God didn't, God didn't get make your parents or grandparents or whoever raised you abuse you. Uh, we can't blame God for that part of your circumstance. That's on people. That's on the sinfulness of people. But what we see 
is that God can reach into a circumstance and he can still bring about his providence and bring about his sovereignty. Even while allowing for people to make their choices, he can still bring about his will and his glory if we would cooperate with him. Esther still had to say yes. If she said no, she was going to die. Her family was going to die. Uh, Mordecai was so convinced that God was still going to keep his promise to, to bring about um, the, the Savior and the Messiah through the people of, of Israel and through the Hebrew people that God was going to raise someone up to save the people. But if, if Esther didn't do it, they, they were definitely going to die. She still had to say yes to living out his will. And I guess what I want to do as we come to this story is, is I want to bring you to a place where you maybe start to see the providence of God in your life that God wants to use you right where you are to live for a higher purpose. But what I want you to do is think about the family you're in, the circumstance you're in, the community you're in, the town you're in, the, the friendships you're in. I want you to look at where God has put you now. And I want you to say, perhaps God has put me here for just a time as this. Perhaps God has something he wants to do in my life, a, a mission, a meaning that he wants me to live for. What is it and where is it? Is it something he wants me to to get brokenhearted over in order to motivate me to move to a place where I finally serve God and grow and make a, cho a choice to live for God's will? Is it something I need to start fasting and, and praying about? Uh, I would say it probably is because as your pastor, I'm encouraging you to join me in fasting and prayer for the lost people in your life who you're connected to. As we lead up to the season where we celebrate Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Is it that he wants you to start finding a way to live for him in the midst of where you are? So often what we want to do is, is we find ourselves up against an obstacle and we say, oh, I, it can't be done. Esther, she looks and she says, well, I can't go to the king. I'll get killed. I can't go to the king. Uh, he, he, I, I can't take the risk that he's going to raise a scepter. It can't be done. Oh, I can't live for Jesus here. I can't, can't reach people here. Can't, can't, can't help my, my aunt or my uncle say yes to Jesus. I can't help my friend turn his life around. I can't do it. Well, maybe you can't, but maybe you were put here for just a time as this and, and maybe there's a time to go ahead and start to be bold and live for God's will. Maybe God has put me right where I am for just a time as this. And I do want to just give a subtle, not a subtle, a, a directed or a pointed message for a specific audience. You pastors and preachers and friends of mine who are joining me, who stuck with me all through this teaching today, and you're still there. I want to remind you, maybe God has put you right where you are for just a time as this. I know you're perplexed. I know your, uh, your struggle. I know that sometimes you're just holding the weight of your ministry on your heart. But I want you to think about how you need to boldly serve God right where you're at. Instead of thinking the grass is greener, instead of looking for a, a, a place. I mean, there's a lot of you right now that want to give up. A lot of you right now are under stress. And, and now is a perfect time to, to get to the work of the gospel uh, in your church. Get fired up. Mourn over where things are and where things have been. And start to fast. Start to pray. And start to say, God, what do you want me to do? And, and, and how can I get to it? You know, God has put you in your ministry for just a time as this. And make no mistake, just like God said to the Apostle Paul, I've given you this ministry. He's saying that to you. I've given you this ministry. Your church, 
gets where he wants you. Your church, he wants you to look at where you are and say, I'm, I'm put here just for a time as this, to lead this church at this time, to help this church grow and reach new people for Christ at this time, to, to start to make changes in my community, in my church at this time. And that's not just true for pastors and preachers, but those of you who are teachers and leaders, those of you who are, who, who are a part of your church body, you have been put right where you are to hear what you're hearing, to be a part of the church you're in for just a time like this. Do you hear the idea that God in his providence is moving and bringing people together? And, and even though people make choices and people bring hurts into the world, this God is still at work bringing about his will. And if you're willing to cooperate, he will even use you to do it. Maybe God's put you right where you are for just a time as this. I started out this morning talking about Charlie Brown. Well, Charlie Brown one time got real philosophical and, and he sort of shared the world's view of the meaning of life. And I, I think Charles Schultz was sort of tongue in cheek sharing this uh, idea as he has Charlie Brown one time he's sitting and, and he says, I know the meaning of life. And he's contemplating the meaning of life. And he says this, the, the meaning of life is to go back to sleep and hope that tomorrow it will be a better day. Well, there's a, a lot of people who that's the way they deal with the brokenness of the world. Well, if I go to sleep, maybe tomorrow will be better. And I think Charlie Brown said that because that's the way a whole lot of people look at life. But when we live for a higher mission, we live differently, don't we? We live in a broken world that sometimes brings us sorrow and mourning and and we look and we might have this sorrow and mourning, even while we have this underlying joy that doesn't go away. And we say, I'm here for just a time as this, not to go to sleep and wake up tomorrow and hope it's better, but to do something to make it better today. What's God calling you to do to make things better today? I'd like to pray for you. Father in heaven, I thank you for the chance to get into this book of Esther and to be almost kicked in the butt. To remember that there is a time to mourn, that there are things we should be sorrowful about, that there is a, a time and a place to have our heart broken by the things that break your heart. God, I, I pray that you will help us not to live as people who are always in that place. Remind us that there are times to be joyful and happy. But God, I pray that you'll help us stop trying to escape the real mourning that we ought to do sometimes. Mourning over the lostness of the world. Or mourning over the brokenness of the world. Mourning over our own sins so that we might make a change. And God, I pray that you'll help us as we fast and pray for the people in our life who we want to see say yes to you so that they can go to heaven and so that they can have eternal life and hope. I pray that you'll help us and guide us and direct us, put names on our heart that we might think about, people that we might pray for. God, I pray that you will help answer the question for us. The question of perhaps God has put me right where I am for such a time as this. The question that asks, to do what? I pray that you'll help us answer that. That you'll give us the answer to it. That you'll lead us and guide us and, and bring to our hearts and minds just what we need to do and say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Well, I want to say thank you for joining me through today's teaching time. I do want to invite you, uh, if, uh, if, if you want to help support the ministry and the work that we're doing as we reach out uh, today, uh, as we reach out every week 
to with a message of the gospel, with a teaching. If you'd like to join us in supporting what we're doing, you're welcome to do that. You can do that in a few ways. You can go online at any time to www.vernonia.church, and there is a giving tab. You could set up giving there. You could give uh, gifts. You could give. You could set up regular automated giving. Um, some people ask, well, well, how much should I give? And and I'll say, whatever you want to give, uh, if you've never given before, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you could set up giving there with uh, online. You could give a dollar a week, a dollar a message, you know, or you could give a more substantial amount. Uh, I give personally, uh, I give, I start with a principle of 10%. That's how I choose what I'm going to give uh, when I give to Jesus. And uh, that's where I start. And so you could do it that way. You could do whatever you want. And I just want to say thank you to those of you who are supporting Bredonia Church, that, that, who are supporting this online ministry. I want to say thank you to you. Your giving is making a difference as we continue to spread the message of the gospel uh, beyond the borders of our little town uh, snuggled into the into the uh, the valley here or into the hillside here of of, of Oregon uh, these messages are going out to many of you who aren't even in Oregon who aren't even in the United States I mean it's amazing to me how far and how far reaching these messages are and so I want to say thank you to those of you who are giving to Vernonia Church I do want to invite you if you're still with me to to pray for the church Church, to pray for the ministry of this church, that we would continue to grow, to reach out to new people with the message of the gospel, that we will always remember to, to that, that, that we're on a mission, on a higher mission, to bring people into the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we pray for Brunonia Church. We pray for the outreach of this church. We pray for the ministry and the outreach of this online teaching time. And we pray for uh, our in-person worship services. God, I do want to pray for the Easter worship service coming up. I want to pray for our online community as they join us for Easter. I want to pray for our in-person community as they join us for Easter. I want to pray for all the people who we're going to be inviting or sending the messages to. Uh, I want to pray, God, that you will be at work in this church to make a difference in this community and around the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Well, let's finish up by declaring it's been a great day together. On the count of three, I'm going to declare it's been a great day. And wherever you are, you're welcome to join me. So here we go. One, two, three. It's been a great day. I look forward to seeing you next week.